Hi everybody, I'm Ruth. Yes, um, Thanks. My presentation is a bit less technical than most of the presentations so far, uh, but I think it will touch on some points uh, from Tor's presentation actually. Um, so yeah, uh, this is uh, kind of a, a, it was supposed to be a, a, a presentation about Calabra's website translation, but I've translated it many moons ago and so I decided to go uh, with something a bit more uh, basic. So three steps to keep in mind when localizing software. So hi, uh, I'm Ruth. Uh, I have some experience in, in translation and localization of software. I did uh, localization QA and translation coordination at Nintendo of Europe. Um, I was in charge of implementing content for 15 languages on Nintendo's website. Uh, well, actually not 15 languages, but eight languages and 15 versions of the website uh, and coordinating that process. I did translation management at Aptoid, where I was in charge of the translation processes of their apps and uh, their website as well. And then in 2020, I translated Collabra's website uh, to Portuguese. Um, so yeah, I have just uh, three slides, but I'm going to dive into them. So the first thing to keep in mind is the original text must be absolutely flawless. Um, so I would say that um, for the biggest uh, part, most of the problems when translating uh, software and content in general uh, it goes down. When you see a bad translation, a lot of the time it goes down to a bad original text. So uh, in software and tech, most of the content gets translated from English. So make sure you have experienced professionals in writing copy text for software. And this is very important. Um, don't get just your marketing guys writing the content uh, or writing the copy text for software. Um, in case of a website, for instance, you have UI text, you have content text, and those are very different. Um, review, review, review. Uh, not only get uh, someone to write the text, get someone else to review the text. Uh, when you are working on text for a really long time, you start uh, missing the problems with of the text, missing uh, typos, mistakes, confusing sentences, because you are so used to the text that you don't see those things anymore. So whenever possible, get someone else to review the text and hopefully a native speaker. This is very important, especially in international companies. Um, being fluent and being a native speaker is different. Uh, the, the sensibility that you have to text is also different. So uh, whenever possible, use a native speaker, but also an experienced native speaker, because sometimes native speakers don't have um, the grammar knowledge or like the, the systematized knowledge of language in their heads that it's also necessary when reviewing text. Uh, yeah, I had just said that content and UI are different. Uh, for websites, this is very obvious. Uh, for apps is or or actual you know hard software I'm gonna call it like this please don't uh, so hard software so like uh, LibreOffice and Calabra is just hard software I'm gonna call it like this this is not a technical term um, but yeah when you are mixing both like in a website it's really important to keep in mind that content and UI have different specificities for the text that uh, is on it uh, and uh, that can be a challenge. Be careful with confusing sentences. Uh, this happens a lot uh, with content specifically because you have longer sentences. Uh, so any sentence that is confusing in English will likely uh, lead to a confusing sentence in other languages. Uh, so uh, keep it short. Uh, the shorter, the better. 
and also uh, if you are uh, providing redundant messages throughout the text, uh, this can be very challenging when translating to other languages because uh, redundancy uh, might not be as easy to translate uh, as uh, it might show up in English. Uh, then be careful with terminology and make a glossary. This is really important. Um, sometimes you'll have the same, um, it, it's very important and very underestimated. Uh, you'll have the same terms appearing over and over again, uh, but, uh, and, and I'm not just talking about uh, a part of the software. I'm also talking about actions that you uh, may um, ask people to perform. So if you say tap a button or press a button, uh, use that every single time you're referring to a button because it just makes language and makes interaction just very, uh, so much more clear. And uh, then think about other languages. English, uh, and this is valid not just for text, but also for design. English is a very uh, synthetic language. Um, most European languages, uh, so Latin-based languages, take up, give or take, 30 to 50 percent, 30 percent more space on a screen or on a button on a UI than English will take. Um, some other family of language, families of languages may even take longer. Others are shorter, but those are uh, the exception, not the rule. So uh, make sure that your design is uh, well fitted to uh, take on the text for other languages. Uh, if you think of uh, German, Slavic languages can be very long as well. They're a lot more verbose than English. Uh, French, Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, uh, Latin-based language, uh, languages are also um, more verbose than English. And what happens uh, very often is that when you translate, uh, the translation by, might be accurate, but there's not enough space for it. And um, when you're using especially UI and copy text, uh, where there isn't a lot of space for it, it just creates overflows and it gets to, like, it breaks the, the design and it looks really terrible uh, for the user. So the second thing is setting things up uh, and things to keep an eye out to make sure that um, it's kind of a, a blissful experience for everybody. Uh, not only the developers who are working on, on, on the process of getting stuff uh, to the translation platform, which we will talk in, in just a few minutes, but also for the translators and uh, for uh, project managers who might be dealing with this. So the first thing is no hard coding on text. This uh, may seem obvious, but uh, it's uh, a common thing that uh, happens. Please don't uh, hard code any strings or any text that will show up to the user because that will be a nightmare to translate afterwards. So if you're creating uh, something and you're already thinking about setting things up for translation and localization yes please don't, don't no hard coding um also keep in mind that images will have to be translated so the less text they have the better it is for everybody because um translating images also has different challenges than than uh, uh than software or some of the main challenges but they pose differently in a technical manner most translation platforms accommodate the translation of images so you can upload the images there but it's a bit of a, a more uh morous uh, more um, tedious process and more manual so um yeah keep that in mind and also define what will be translated continuously so here on the screenshot i don't know if you can see but this is from uh the portuguese version of of the website of collabora's website um and yeah so we have the buttons here on top that says uh comunidade empresa so like all the news community uh company uh press releases etc uh, but then we have a search box that in, is in English and the content is in English. Now, obviously, um, this is down to the company uh, resources and decisions 
uh, because translating content continuously is a lot of work and requires a lot of people. Um, but yeah, like keep in mind that some some parts of your website might not all be translated uh, and and yeah, define in advance what will be translated continuously because then you can add some uh, some notes saying even just saying that some of the content might not be available in all languages, etc. Um, and then supporting the translators. So uh, before um, you pass on the text, uh, make sure you pick a good translation platform. There are plenty up, out there. I use a screenshot of Weblate. Uh, it, it was not what I used for Collabra's web, website, but uh, Weblate is an open source platform as well, and it's being used to translate Collabra's software, I think, at the minute. So yeah, make sure you pick a good translation platform. And uh, a good translation platform is a platform that allows for context. Uh, context obviously can be provided with screenshots and you should always have screenshots of the text that you're translated whenever possible, but also provide other cues for context. So if you leave, if you leave breadcrumbs uh, or like the code of the string saying like, um, you know, if it's a button, say that it's a button, uh, that's just good practices. And uh, for an experienced translator, uh, it gives extra cues as to what the, the, that text will be used on. And it's a lot like um, English, uh, before I was talking about how it's um, a very uh, a very synthetic language, it's very short language. Um, and for instance, uh, verbs don't get, uh, like verb tenses and verb forms are very simple in English. And if uh, comparing to Portuguese, for instance, where there are uh, three forms of subjunctive and each person, singular and plural, has its own verb form. Uh, so it might be very different uh, if the same word is on a button or if it's used somewhere else. And that's very important to have extra content uh, context. And also um, define a tone and design a style guide. So a tone is how you communicate. It's like the basic um, terms or the basic uh, familiarity, the level of familiarity in which you address uh, your user or your customer. It is different if you're talking to a user or a customer uh, as well. Um, and design a style guide. Um, setting a tone and a style guide, they're kind of aligned, but a, a tone is just a more generic overview on how you address your user or your customer, etc. Um, and that can be that has to be set in English and is something that is, uh, you know, translated to uh, or it can be transposed to a different language uh, very easily is what you will tell um, the translator like, oh, we are uh, we use a very formal type of language or we we would like to keep it very casual. That's the tone. Um, and in English, for instance, uh, it's not always easy to assume a tone because, uh, for instance, they only have one usage of the second person. So it's you and you, and there's no formal you or a casual you. Everything is you. Uh, also, singular and plural can um, be different depending on the language. Um, so, for instance, uh, in, uh, in German, you have du and sie which do is very informal and Z is a formal uh, uh, type of addressing the other person. Um, in Portuguese, uh, it is uh, sometimes you have uh, um, tu and nós. Very often you use uh, uh, um, uh, the, the plural of the first word of the first uh, person to uh to to decline verbs to make it more friendly or to build a sense of community um uh, so these things are something that would be included in a style guide so define you can uh, think of tone as something that is set for all languages um in a more of a, an umbrella type of way and then the style guide you should work directly with the translators of each uh, 
if each language and are language specific um so you know the things that i just mentioned so setting up how you address to people if if it's very formal or not how uh you uh use verbs how uh you use terminology um and just minor uh things that will make text flow a lot better and make things less confusing for those who are reading and um that's it uh for me so, so thank you i hope this was useful